Hello, One Life Church family. Well, it's Sparkle Time again. And this year, our ladies' conference is in Malta, Cape Town, Durban, and Peter Maritzburg. Now, we've gone to great lengths to get top speakers. In addition to that, as usual, ladies, we have come up with a gospel presentation with dance and media that's going to be absolutely captivating. In addition to that, we've subsidized it significantly this year cost-wise so that we can jam-pack these facilities. Now, the question I want to answer is why? Why do we go to these lengths every year? These extraordinary lengths to present Jesus in a unique way. Well, it's because we know that there are people who wouldn't ordinarily come to church on a Sunday. And it's for them that we're creating these environments. So their children will be looked after. They will have the gospel presented in a way that really speaks to women. So we're asking you over the next few weeks to put a list together of people you want to pray for, that you're going to invite to come and join you, your friends, your sisters, your moms, your daughters, your work colleagues, uh, your neighbors, and then trust God for a moment to be able to invite them to come to this amazing weekend where they're going to hear Jesus in a way that's going to be compelling and meaningful to them. So uh, have a look at these details and then ask God to show you who to invite. Though outwardly we are wasting away, an inward renewing can be found day by day. Though hard pressed, struck down on every side, we will fix our eyes on the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed, for an all surpassing power. A treasure is set in these jars of clay. Oh, good morning, everyone. And uh, good morning to those who are online. We've got uh, two live broadcasts today because of the power issues in KZN. So uh, welcome to those who are online. So if you're online and you're wanting to know how to book onto Sparkle, you can go and look at the website to see the Sparkle closest to you. And those of you in the south are going to have that explained to you at the end of the meeting. So we've come to an end of our series today entitled Family Flaws. And what we've been doing is we've been looking at different families in the Bible that have really struggled. It's good to look at families that have struggled, eh? Gives us encouragement. And, and then preach the gospel into parenting and into marriage and into friendship, etc. It's been our holiday series. Now, today we end that by... By looking at what it takes to swim against the tide. To live in a world that is going mad. A world that is increasingly anti-Christian. How to raise our kids in a world where teachers and curriculum and social media and constitutions are increasingly setting themselves up against the Bible. And so... The tribe, the family that we're going to go and look at today is in Daniel chapter 3. It's one of my most favorite uh, chapters of the Bible. It places itself in Babylon, and there's a king on the throne there called Nebuchadnezzar. He was very full of himself, but he was like a world power. One day, he came up with this plan to build himself a statue 25 meters high. That's more than double the height of that back wall. Three meters wide, a golden statue. Imagine how much that was worth. And his idea behind the statue was to get unity in his kingdom by getting everybody to think the same, to believe the same, to worship the same, to have a worldwide religion. 
And this is what he said. I'm going to get my bands to strike up a musical tune. And when they do, everybody has got to be the same, behave the same, worship the same. And then we'll have unity. He thought it was a great plan. And he issued the decree. And in fact, it worked. Except that in his kingdom, there were a group of people called the Jews who didn't worship idols. And so the astrologers that were around to him noticed it and came to Nebuchadnezzar and basically told on them and said, listen, there's some Jews and there's some pretty profiled Jews who are governors in Babylon who are not worshiping as you wanted them to worship. So he calls them in because the penalty, if you didn't follow this worldwide religion, was that you were going to get cast into, a, into, into fire, into a, into a furnace. So these three young Jewish boys, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego wind up in front of Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar says, is it true? Are you not worshiping as I told you to worship? Are you not thinking the way I told you to think? Are you not obeying me? Are you not coming into line? Are you creating division in the kingdom? And they said, listen, no matter what you say, we're not going to worship your idol. It says, in an instant, his attitude to them changed immediately. And he heated up that fire seven times what it should be heated. These little Jewish guys had said to him, our God is able to deliver us from you, and he will, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to worship your God. So Nebuchadnezzar bound them up. He gives the instruction. The soldiers, because the fire was so hot, were accustomed to walking to a certain distance. Not very clever. They died as they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in. Nebuchadnezzar took up his seat, front row, Sunday afternoon entertainment. He's looking into the fire. And he's astonished. They're not burning up. In fact, they're walking around. And then he leaps to his feet and he says, didn't we chuck in three? I can see four. And the fourth one looks like the son of the gods. At that point, he gets as close as he can get to the fire and he shouts in a very undignified way, come out. They come out and his prefects and his satraps and his governors all gather around him. And they stand and they look. They're trying to touch these guys. What, what's happened? They, di- they don't even smell of smoke, it says. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in whom they have put their trust, for he has delivered them. Verse 28. And then he promotes them. He's, and then he protects them. He says, if anyone speaks badly about this God, we're going to tear their houses to shreds. We're going to cut them into pieces. And he has a a moment in his life, this worldwide tyrannical governor has a glimpse of Jesus and he understands that God is God. The next chapter is as fascinating as the first. God warns Nebuchadnezzar, humble yourself. God's revealed himself to him. He's basically saying, humble yourself and worship God. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't. It says there midway through that chapter that he was standing on his rooftop surveying his kingdom thinking there is no better king than me. And God makes him insane. He had warned him it would happen. He winds up in a field with the cattle, totally ungroomed. It says his nails looked like claws. His hair, he must have been quite a hairy dude, looked like feathers of a bird. And then in an instant... God restores his sanity and gives him back his kingdom. Babylon, this despicable world power, which is forcing people to worship the one way, think the same way, is ruled by a man that God puts there and takes away and puts there and takes away. Now the book of Revelation tells us that the generation that's living in the last days before the return of Jesus will be living in Babylon. Now, I don't think he's saying it's the actual literal place, Babylon. You know where Babylon is today? It's a pile of ruins in Iraq. Now, I suppose someone could rebuild it. Saddam Hussein, for those of you old enough to remember that guy, said he was going to rebuild Babylon. It didn't really work for him, did it? But I suppose with the money in the Middle East, they could do that. But the book of Revelation isn't talking about one particular place. It's talking about a worldwide religion, 
a worldwide pressure, a worldwide system, a worldwide dispensation that wants to force itself and impose itself on the world. And it says, the book of Revelation, that the people who are living in the last generation on earth are going to be living in Babylon. Now, if you ever look up at church history, that would be us. Or the generation immediately after us. But we certainly live in close to the end. So the question is, how do we live in this Babylon? What can we learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And what does the Bible say? Because that's the important thing that we've got to look at. So what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to give you a quick five-minute summary of the first 17 chapters of the book of Revelation. And then we're going to go to chapter 17, which speaks about Babylon. And we're going to see how we can walk like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in these last days. So firstly, some of you are going to say, but listen, I don't have much of an imagination. So every time I read the book of Revelation, I sort of like freak out because I can't picture what's being described. If you don't have a good imagination, hang on to your seatbelts today. I'm going to try to help you, but you can't read the book of Revelation without understanding it's mo- there's a huge amount of symbolism there. You, and you've got to see, okay, so that's the picture. What is that picture telling us? So, example, when Jesus is called a lion, doesn't mean he grows a mane and whiskers. It means that he's a king, that he's ruling, that he's powerful. When Jesus is called a lamb, he doesn't have to become like a transformer and become all willy. It's talking about his sacrifice and his tenderness and his love and his care. And, and when the devil is described as the dragon, it's not like Puff the Magic Dragon. It is, it is a dragon-like nature. So the book is full of symbolism. In addition, the book has scenes in heaven, scenes on earth, and you've got to know what you're looking at. Are you looking at something that's seen in the heavenlies, which is actually the spiritual power behind what's happening, or are you seeing actually what's played out on earth? Now, the book of Revelation starts like this. Chapter 1, old guy John on the island of Patmos, the disciple John. His rest of his mates are dead. They've all been martyred. He's in his 90s. Why did God choose John to live? Well, the rest of them lost their heads, were crucified, etc., but he chose John to give the revelation of judgment. Remember, John was the apostle of love. So this is written, this judgment time is written by the apostle of love. Imagine if Peter was given this revelation. Peter, who took out swords, chopped out his ears off, wanted to call down fire. Revelation would look very different if it was seen through the eyes of Peter. God reserves John. He's an old man. He hasn't seen Jesus for 60 years, and he's aware that Jesus is behind him. He turns, and he sees Jesus. He's terrified. Jesus puts his hand on his shoulder, and then he sees Jesus standing between seven lampstands, which are pictures, again, not actual lampstands. They're pictures of churches. And the light of the lamp describes the light of the church. When Jesus looks at us, he sees your light. He sees his glory coming through you. And he speaks tenderly to those churches. And then it's like John no longer is looking at churches on earth. He's looking up into heaven and he sees the throne room, a big throne, God on it, rainbow around it, elders seated, flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, worship going on. And then John begins to cry because in God's hand there is a scroll. And that scroll signifies the events that we are living in the last days. It's written on both sides in immaculate detail, but it's tightly shut up. And the reason John is crying is that no one is found who's worthy to oversee the last days. And then someone says to John, stop crying. Look, here he is. And the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, comes and he takes the scroll. So in other words, the future of the world is in the hands of the Lion and the Lamb, Jesus. He's got it because he died like a lamb and he rules through it because he is the lion of Judah. He's got it. Now you've got to understand that the future of the world is in his hands. Just like Nebuchadnezzar in those days was in God's hands. After the pastures you go, boy, okay, you learned your lesson. Back you come. Now you might say, because if you've read the book of Revelation, you'll know that from that chapter, chapter 6, 
through to chapter 18 is what the Bible calls the tribulation, which is judgments that are poured out on the earth. You see spiritual things happening, but there's judgment on the earth, hard times on the earth. They're described by seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls, which describe the judgments, the hard times on earth. And you say, well, why does God allow the hard times? Well, you see it the whole way through the tribulation. He says, and still they did not repent. Then you see him look up back into heaven, and he sends out an angel with the eternal gospel to the, all the earth. And so what God is doing is he's allowing the hardship to shake people out of their apathy to get them come to their senses. And he's saying, repent, turn to me. Don't go the way of the rest of the world. And so that's up to chapter 17. It's called the tribulation. But in the tribulation, we look back into the heavenlies and we give in some more pictures. So those without an imagination, hold your seatbelts right now. I'm going to give you some pictures. Jesus has a bride, that's you and me, and he's coming back for his bride, that's you and me. The dragon, which is the devil, also has a bride, but she's called the prostitute. So that there's the groom Jesus with his bride, the church, there's the devil with his prostitute. Now the prostitute is a replacement of the church. It's an alternative to the church. It's spiritual. And the prostitute is also called Babylon. We'll see it just now. Because remember what Babylon was. Babylon was this wealthy place where the king, the authority, imposed this worship, imposed this way of thinking. This prostitute is also called Babylon. But that prostitute is put there by two beasts. I told you I was going to stretch your imagination. The first beast... You'll read about him in Revelation 13. He's described as having seven heads, which in 13 and in chapter 17 are described as rulers of very powerful countries. And then it has 10 horns. And at the back end of chapter 17, those 10 horns are described as another 10 rulers. So what is this beast? They world governors that come together and this is what it says in chapter 13, to war against the Lamb. I'm telling you, these governors, these heads of states, don't even know that their principal job is to war against the church because the dragon, the devil, is behind them and he's setting them up to do just that, just like Nebuchadnezzar. But there's not only one beast, there's another beast. And that beast, in chapter 13, verse 11, is described like this. He looked like the Lamb. But he spoke like the dragon, the second beast. He's also called in chapter uh, 17 and 19, the false prophet. So if the first beast is this worldwide league of nations headed up by an anti-Christ leader, his friend is very charismatic, very spiritual, and is setting up a system of thinking, a system of worship that is alternative to Christianity, alternative to Jesus, and that is called the prostitute. You got it. So those are the pictures. Now, now let's see, because if we're living in Babylon, we need to know that Jesus, just like he allowed his people to be in Babylon, allows us to be here. He is supremely in command. He's holding the future in his hands. The rulers that think they have authority and power are there only by the will of God. And he sends them and he brings them according to his beckoning. And this is his will that no one is lost. And if you read in between the pages, right up to just before chapter 19, just before he comes, just before Jesus returns, there will be a revival on earth where millions upon millions upon millions turn to Christ. That's his plan. So, are we ready for chapter 17? One of the seven angels, verse 1, came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute. This worldwide philosophy is going to get punished. Who sits by many waters. Now, verse 15 tells us that many waters represent the sea of humanity. 
So this worldwide philosophy is going to be over the whole of humanity. It's, it's with her that the kings of the earth committed adultery. In other words, worldwide rulers are going to say, we like this religion. Just like Nebuchadnezzar, they're going to say, we think it's a good idea to have a worldwide set of values, worldwide ideology, worldwide philosophy. It's not the Bible that's outdated. We've got our own system. And the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of adultery. They're going to drink it in. You're going to drink it in through your TV. You're going to drink it in through your school curriculum. You're going to drink it in through your government and your world leaders. You're going to drink it in from your friends as they become intoxicated with these philosophies. And they all bow down and they worship what is not Jesus. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Here we're back to this prostitute again. There she's now sitting on the rulers. In other words, what is that picture telling us? That these ideas are totally smokling the thinking of the leaders. Sorry about that word. Especially those who are watching online and have no idea what that is. She was sitting on the beast that was covered in blasphemous names that had seven heads and ten horns. Just in case you thought it was another beast. No, no, no. It's, it's this one. It's worldwide governments led by an antichrist, possibly, that are against Jesus. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and glittering with gold. She can look so attractive. In other words, these philosophies, this thinking, this idea about uh, concerning minority groups, about your sexuality, about your gender, about how the world should live together in peace and harmony, it's going to look so attractive. Glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand. So it's, it's designed for you to drink it, to make it part of yourself with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. No, 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 no. Because women are so sacred, we're gonna, you can drink this cup and you can abort billions of babies. It's fine. It looks very attractive. It's dressed up very, it's, it's sterilized. You say, well, what are these adulteries? Well, what is clear is that they're going to be anti the Bible, and they're going to move into, I think, the realm of your identity, and actually even how the church should behave. The name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abomination of the earth. So in other words, to be called, for this philosophy to be called Babylon, Babylon the Great, it means that it's very attractive, like Babylon was. It's very powerful, like Babylon was. It's pervasive. In other words, it's a world power, like Babylon was. And it's imposing. It's going to be forced on you. You say, God, nobody's going to force me to think in any certain way. How can they force us in this day and age with all our rights? Well, a little quick look at our last two years will show us that a couple of very powerful people can tell you exactly what to wear, exactly what to fear, exactly what you think the remedy is, exactly how to think about other people who don't think like that, exactly what to say, and they don't even know what they're doing. But it's a test run. They can flex it. They have power to control. Just think. Who was it that decided that the whole world should be shut down like that? Happened very quickly, very powerfully. It can happen. I'm not saying that that was the Antichrist. I'm saying that world powers have authority to control. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people. We want to shut down the churches. We want to shut down what they believe. We want to shut down what they worship. We want to take away their Bible because that is discriminatory. We want to adjust the way they... We want them to worship like we worship. We want them to think like we think. Then we will have world peace and world harmony. The blood of those who bore the testimony to Jesus. And when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. It's like John looks and says, surely not. Surely the church can't be gobbled up by her. Surely people can't think like her. Surely Christians aren't going to go down and worship like this. The angel says to me, why are you astonished? 
This is exactly what the devil was planning. They have one purpose. These kings, these rulers, these architects of this philosophy, they will give their power and authority to the beast, and they will wage war against the lamb. You shouldn't be astonished. Just like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were pushed into a corner, you shouldn't be astonished if that happens in the last days. But the lamb will triumph. Just like it was in Nebuchadnezzar's day, it says here, but the lamb will triumph over them because he's the Lord of lords and he's the king of kings. And in case Nebuchadnezzar forgot, he just stuck him into a field to remind him that Jesus is the Lord of lords and the king of kings and with him will be all his chosen and faithful followers. Now, if you go on to read the chapter, we haven't got time for it, you will see that the way Jesus overcomes Babylon, that harlotry, that way of thinking, that worship, all those ideologies and principles, is that the beast takes her out. In other words, world rulers suddenly decide, we don't like all these philosophies. We're going to change them and implode it on itself, and so it will self-destruct the beast and the lamb. Oh, sorry, the beast and the, and the prostitute. And so, before we just go and wrap this up, let's go back to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. And so, what can we learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Because we can see that the parallels are very, very close. So, the first thing we can see is that the astrologers came to Nebuchadnezzar and says, there is a group of people that are not worshiping what we worship. The Jews. What you see is these three guys they, they, and, and the Jewish community, they're worshiping together. What we get from the book of Daniel is that don't try and go through Babylon imperialism on your own. Do not forget to meet together as some are in the habit of doing. Because when you go on... On your own, you're like a sitting duck, man. You'll, you'll drink in. Your kids will be given the cup to drink. And next minute, you'll be floating down in the ideologies of Babylon. I travel around the world a lot. And one of the things that's most heartbreaking to me is to see South Africans that go abroad who think it's a, a better decision. But I'm telling you, Babylon is starting out there in the Western world and then cre creeping its way into us. And they think they can you go into Babylon itself and not be in a good, healthy local church, and their kids are going to be fine. Or when their kids go to school, and they're sitting in the midst of Babylon, and they're drinking the milk of Babylon, and they're not in a community of believers, why are they surprised when they hit teenagehood and they're thinking like Nebuchadnezzar? The lesson I think we learn is that we worship together. I'm not talking about like having a kibbutz and we all go live in the same place. I'm talking about you come together to worship, to pray together, to, to, to stand together. That's why connect groups are so important. Where people get into your home and you get into their home and you share your faith together. Don't try be a sitting duck. There's a young guy who is a worship leader down in Cape Town. And he is at Stellenbosch University. These young men in Babylon were put into the greatest universities of Babylon. And so our young men are in this university. And on a Friday night, what they do is they take out their guitars, a couple of these guys, one from another church, one from ours, and they begin to lead worship. One of the, uh, the rezes there, I think it's called Dachbreak, Break. I think there's thousands of men that live there, and on a Friday night, they get out the guitar about 9, 10 o'clock at night, and they begin to worship in the quad. And often on a Friday night, hundreds of men come out of the dorms and begin to worship together. What is that? In the middle of Babylon, they're standing together, and they're worshiping God together. That's what we get out of this text. What else do we get here? We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter, they say to Nebuchadnezzar. They call him your majesty, so they're not being irreverent. They're just saying, we're not on the defensive here. Listen, if you know how this thing ends, you are not on the defensive. The kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. And forceful people lay hold of it. 
You don't have to excuse yourself or apologize or get onto the ropes. There's a man who is in our Woodstock site. He's the MD of a a multinational. He's the South African uh, head of it, of of this multinational company. And uh, the headquarters, I don't know where it is, somewhere in Europe, issued a decree that everybody had to choose between one of the pronouns that describe their gender. And so what he decided was just to leave it blank. And so he was called to book by the top brass on a Zoom call. And they said to him, why are you defying that instruction? So this is what he says. My identity is not defined by a pronoun, a couple of letters, or anything else you tell me. My identity is defined by Jesus Christ. Oh, I was proud of him. He understood he's not on the back foot. He's on the front foot. Somehow these guys found the courage. Verse 17, if we are thrown into a blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us, your majesty. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods and worship the image of God or gold that you have set up. Somehow these guys found courage. And Nebuchadnezzar knew how they found the courage. Verse 28, he said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in whom they put their trust. Because these guys trusted God, they had courage to go through a fire. And their courage was not defined on whether God was going to save them or not. Their courage was defined by the fact that they trusted God. They said, we think he's going to deliver us from your flames, but even if he doesn't, we're not listening to you because we trust him, we don't trust you. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says to them, stand firm in your faith. Be strong and courageous. In other words, your faith gives you your strength and your courage. So here's the question, and I'm going to just summarize this very quickly because we've run out of time. What did Jesus say about you and about the end? Because if you know that, you can trust him not only with salvation, but you can trust him with the future. You can trust him with what he's going to do to Babylon. We've already seen in chapter 17 that the worldwide philosophies of this age are going to come crumbling down. All these ideas are going to come crashing to the floor. No matter how nicely they dressed up now. Chapter 18 tells us that the beast, the world power, the power block of nations is going to come crashing down in an instant. And they're going to weep and wail and say, no one's buying our shipments of gold. And the power that underpinned their insistence on anti-Christ worship is going to come crashing to the floor. And then chapter 19 says this. John looks up into heaven and he sees heaven open and he sees Jesus on a white horse. Now, we're not talking about nostrils on a mane. This is imagery. Jesus is about to come back. And he's coming back, chapter 19 tells us, for two things. He's coming back with judgment of those who've turned their back on him, and he's coming back for the bridal supper. And you are the bride who's invited. So in the one instance, you're going to see the eyes of a warrior, and the next you're going to see the bridegroom, eyes like a dove. You say, God, well, how can he judge? You know, Hollywood script writers have loved to describe this Armageddon that's going to happen in the end. Somehow painting pictures that there are armies of heaven, intergalactic, or you guys all picking up AK-47s, jumping on horses, is not what the Bible says. The Bible says the beast is going to be overcome at the coming of Jesus. Chapter 19 says Jesus is splattered in blood. That's a picture to say he's judging. We're all riding with him, dressed in white, the ones who've died. Not a spot of blood on us. Don't worry, we're not in an intergalactical battle. The Bible describes him coming back in chapter 19. It is a foundation truth of our faith that Jesus is allowing this tribulation to go on. He's allowing, and this is what he's doing. He's sending out his angel through the church. He's stirring up the church to spread his gospel 
And just before the end, you will see there is a golden age of millions upon millions who surrender to Christ. And in chapter uh, 20, it talks about the devil being locked away and the new heaven and the new earth being made. Now there's a little bit of debate in-house in churches as to the sequence of all these events, but it's not heresy and orthodoxy. It's just a little bit of a debate of the sequence of events. But I want to get straight to the very last thing that I want to say today. Maybe the band could come forward while I'm getting here. Because if our courage comes from trusting God, not only to save us, but what he sees in us and our future, we need to know how he describes it. So here's one last picture for those who are battling with the images. Stretch your mind one last time. In chapter 21, he describes the people of God who are going to be with God for all eternity. The previous chapter, it also described all those who had chosen their own way, which winds up to be hell. You know what hell is? Anywhere that God is not. It's a place that people have chosen to go. They said, blow you, Jesus. I want to do it my way. I want to take my hatred. Imagine hatred in eternity away from the goodness of God. What that's going to look like. That is hell. Imagine jealousy an eternity away from the goodness of God. At the moment, God sustains all things by his powerful word. But there is coming a moment where he says, I'm going to give you over to yourselves. Off you go. You don't want to be with me, so that's where you're going. It's away from light, goodness, love, God himself. That's where it is. That's where judgment is. That's what the lake of fire is. That's where everyone's going. That is not responding to the gospel. And so one last time, what he does, he describes what his people look like. And so in chapter 21, he gives us some pictures. One is a bride. We're familiar with that one. But the one I want to focus on here, he says, here's his people, his bride, and he uses them interchangeably. Here's his people, his bride, the city. The people of God are described as a city. Remember, it's picture language. You don't suddenly become brick and mortar. It's a picture to describe you. And this is what it says. Then I saw the new heaven and the new earth, the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down. It shone with the glory of God. Didn't need any sun or moon because God was inside. The goodness of God is with us for all eternity. No more crying, no more shame, no more sin, no more hatred, no more rape, no more pedophilia. It's gone. The glory of God is in the midst. It had a great high wall with 12 gates around it and with 12 angels at those gates. Why does he describe the people of God with a wall around it? What does a wall do? A wall makes it clear you are in or you're out. That's what a wall does. Is that like a gray area? A little bit of Babylon, a little bit of Jesus. A little bit of Nebuchadnezzar, a little bit of the church. There is a wall. You are in or you're out. That's what the city looks like. Fortunately, it has gates in it. That's how we get in. And he's inviting the world to come in. The Bible says he doesn't want one to be lost. He doesn't want one to say, blow you, God, I'm going for eternity by myself. Those gates also signify what happens at the the gates. There was elders there. There was government there. We're not going to float around in a fluffy white cloud and disembodied spirits like little chubby angels with wings on. He's using imagery to describe a future that is far better than we've ever known before. And it's had removed from it for all eternity. So if you look right at the very end of your Bible, this is chapter 21, only one more chapter to go. He's saying this is what it's going to be like. And like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we can say we trust you, God. Because you are good and you are holy. And we shouldn't be surprised if Babylon is trying to force things down our throat. And if Babylonian idealists were listening to me right now, they would start hissing at me. How dare you say it? Jesus said it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father except through Him. Let's stand together. I trust two things have happened today. One, 
is that the Holy Spirit has put courage in you. And if anyone's unsettled here today and you're a Christian, I'm trusting that while we sing this last song, the courage would come upon you. And if any of you have found yourself living like Nebuchadnezzar, thinking like Nebuchadnezzar, what he says in chapter 17, we don't have time to read it, he says, tell them to come out. Tell my people to come out. Come out of Babylon. And the bride comes down getting, she's made herself ready, it says in chapter 19, dressed in a robe of righteousness. Jesus says, I'll make you righteous. Just trust me. You don't have to be Babylonian. You can be in Babylon, but not of Babylon. But it's also possible that you're here today and you realize you're not in, you're out. And you realize now why you've been dragged to this church service or why you might even brought yourself here. Is that the eternal gospel has gone out, the good news, that you don't have to spend eternity away from God. That the gates are open. That Jesus says, surrender to me. Trust me with your future. Trust me with your salvation. Trust me with your, with, with your health. Trust me. Are you ready to trust him today? Just close our eyes. Are you ready to surrender to him today? Just raise your hands toward heaven. If you're ready to do that today, just raise your hands toward heaven. Well done. Well done. Well done. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, those who've raised your hands. And this is a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer. Like Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's the King of Kings. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I surrender today. I surrender to your Lordship. I put my trust in you. God of heaven, God of earth. I ask you to bring me into your kingdom. And I ask you to put your kingdom in me. And remove Babylon. Remove sin. Wash it from me. And when I make mistakes in the future, wash me clean. Make me a new creation. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for those who've whispered that prayer today, those who've surrendered today, that you would knit them into your body. Your word says that the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. If you're watching online, I would encourage you yeah, get hold of us. Or find a church near you that preaches the gospel. You don't want to bob around in Babylon alone. Let's worship God together. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We choose to worship you.